What a gift to get music written just for your sermon. <laughs> that happens every week here? That's amazing. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Bill. So good morning. morning. We are on day seven of this church having a new associate minister for social justice. (laughs) Can you feel the difference already? (laughs) It's obvious. Well, I can really feel the difference. (laughs) My husband and I moved here from Washington, D.C. I got here in July. He got here just a couple of weeks ago. We are settling into what feels like new dimensions in space and time. It is a cultural shift, a physical shift, it's a delightful shift. People are saying, how are you settling in? Well, the physical settling in is still happening, and the cultural settling in is this ongoing project that we expect to unfold for quite some time. But I have learned what Iowa chops are. Delicious. I've found some beautiful parks to walk in, and I have now tried fried Snickers and fried brownies at the fair. I still don't know where to get really good homemade um, ice cream at a shop, so let me know. I'm kind of a Ben & Jerry's friend, aficionado, so if you know where I can find that locally, I welcome the input. But as my husband and I learn how to be a couple and live here in the state of Iowa, we find ourselves talking over and over again about patience and learning. It's a familiar conversation in our relationship, and I imagine you've had ones like this in your life, too. Because you graduate from one school and you start over at another. Your kids get older and suddenly they need you less, or at least they want you around less, and you have to find new ways to relate and engage. You retire, you go back to work, you get ill, you recover. All of these things create transitions and change in our lives. And life means learning how to live with new circumstances over and over again, even if you haven't just moved here. Gandhi says, live as if you were to die tomorrow and learn as if you were to live forever. (laughs) That sounds exhausting to me. (laughs) It's so lofty and inspirational, but in reality, I just think, oh, learn as if you were to live forever. Because when I'm in the process of learning, it's not nearly um, as easy or fun as once I've learned something and I've got it in my pocket and I can use it. It's so much less effort. Because learning actually, while it's awesome, it takes energy, it takes work. So I came across, as I was thinking about this process of learning that I find myself in again, looking back to books from seminary, and I came across this little excerpt about learning from a book called The Learning Congregation. When we learn, we have a fundamental shift of mind. Learning involves a transformation in our perspective, a change in the mental maps through which we make sense of reality. And once we see the world differently, we cannot help but think and behave differently. As the mental maps that guide us change, the course of our lives also change. That's why it's hard work. (laughs) You know, when I think about changing my mental maps, first of all, it has to involve the willingness to dare to think that I have a mental map that could use uh, an update, right? And then it takes work to unearth it from just the entrenched embeddedness of my life, to pull that up and then be willing to take a new map and actually try it and live with it before we fully know how to work with it. So that is no small task. And whenever I'm struggling about learning, my husband often reminds me of this story, which is really, um, I appreciate it. He reminds me that learning is taxing work. And he knows this from his own life experience, but also he has uh, taught couples how to partner dance for quite some time now. He has been partner dancing since he was in high school, and so he's been practicing and learning for several decades now. And when he teaches new couples, often the man will show up and say, I have two left feet and I don't know how to do this. And he says, that's great, that gives me a job. That's why you're here, because you don't know how. But minutes later, typically after the very first song, the guy will say, see, I don't know how to do this. I can't do it. 
and he'll remind them that the reason you're there is to acquire skills you didn't already possess. Nobody goes to take a class in something you already know everything about, right? And women are no different. Men and women both show up, and after the first song, they want and expect that they can already dance proficiently, as if learning is about perfection rather than progress. And Joshua will often say, how long did it take you to learn to walk? It took more than a song, right? <laughs> it took more than a day. And that helps me remember, because it's awkward, right? That learning, and especially when you have a partner and you're trying to dance, it's awkward and you don't want to let your partner down. You want to do it right already. We want mastery rather than practice. And I'm talking about this today, the spiritual nature of learning, for a very specific reason. They say ministers preach what they need to hear about, so I need to hear this. <laughs> but also, as a new minister starting in this congregation, I'm not the only one who's invited into learning and into this new work. Bringing a second minister to your church means that you are also in transition as a congregation and as a staff. And it's going to take learning on all of our parts to make our way through this transition effectively. And especially if you've been involved in the social justice ministry of this church, you already have so many inspiring ways of operating. And Mark says that you've done this without much staff support. I have to say, I see Mark's name all over social justice efforts. I know he's not involved in everything, but I've seen him, his name pop up on the board of different organizations in town, and that he's been deeply involved in Amos, the interfaith community organizing. And so I just think Mark is maybe very humble. <laughs> I know that it has bothered him that he hasn't been able to give social justice ministry the time and attention that he thinks it deserves but I also think he's pretty impressive in his own right. But regardless, figuring out how that primarily lay-led ministry is gonna incorporate a full-time person will be more fun and more powerful if we are willing to stay on that dance floor together longer than one song. Through the awkward introductions, through the stepping on each other's toes, oops. I've been dancing for a long time, and somebody said, so has that increased your coordination? And I said, when does that start to happen? <laughs> so it's inevitable that we're going to be, I'm going to be <laughs> a little awkward and graceful at times. But trying to figure out who's leading who, and when the song ends, and when it starts, and how to transition, that that is going to be a little difficult at times. So let's not expect ourselves to start out as masters right away. And let's keep on the floor for more than one song. Because the first one may not be our tune, but the next one we may rock. <laughs> and now I understand that not everyone here will want to be on the dance floor with us. Maybe social justice ministry, that's not your tune. You have other responsibilities or interests that you're focusing on. But perhaps you can still encourage us and support us in remaining in that learning curve about each other, about the wider community, and the ways that our faith can serve in the world. So I'm just naming today what you already know, and I fully expect that this is how we're going to engage. From all the research I did about this church, you are strongly interested in learning and growth. It's one of the things that primarily attracted me to this congregation. It's not just that people as individuals are interested in their own development, but also your ability to work collectively as an institution to bring about relevant, meaningful change in your lives and in the broader community. And that matters to me deeply as a minister. Because if we're a learning church, we're much more likely to be an effective church in people's lives. We're here not to keep the status quo. We're here to keep opening to life, expecting to love, and prepared, being prepared to serve. Learners are reflective, they're flexible, they're willing to change, willing to let go, so that we can remain relevant and meaningful in people's lives, which means our faith can then make a difference. And that is a purpose worth serving. I was given some guidelines in seminary for how to be a learning congregation that I want to share with you. And they, if you're not a church geek like me, that's okay. 
This relates to our personal lives as well. And they come from a book called The Learning Congregation. And the author explains that he had a friend in Idaho who went whitewater rafting. And that before she was allowed to even get into the raft, she had to memorize a few rules. And those rules, it struck him, applied to working together in ministry and also to how we live our lives. So you can see for yourselves. All right, good morning. My name is Erin, and I am going to be your rafting guide. We are headed down this river of life. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. So given all the rain this past week, the water is flowing. So the rapids are a bit dangerous today. They've been classified at level five. How many of you have ever been down level five rapids? Raise your hands. Just to, okay, so it's survivable, great. I've never been down that, <laughs> that level, but I'm really glad to know that we're gonna be okay. At least some people have made it. All right, so we do have a few uh, tips to get to five, in fact, one for each finger that we will keep throughout this journey. And my boss is a real stickler about all five of these, in particular because we want to be sure that we come back with as many people as we left with, or my boss says, your tips will suffer. So, let's get down to business. First, it is a big river, and we are going to be out there a long time. So you're going to want to pace yourselves and rest in the calm spots. There are always going to be more rapids ahead. And when they arrive, we're going to need our strength. So better not waste all your energy trying to paddle us faster all by yourself. We'll speed up together eventually. So relax, enjoy those calm waters, save your energy for paddling around the big rocks when they show up, because they will. So that's the first rule. What is it? Rest. Rest in the calm spots. Yeah. So second rule is never stop paddling. <laughs> what? Yes, rest in the calm spots and never stop paddling. Here's how it makes sense. Just because we made it around that last rock doesn't mean the other ones up ahead care. And if we stop paddling, we're going to lose momentum. And you know what makes it easy to avoid hitting those big rocks? Momentum. So we're going to work together as a crew to listen to one another, to paddle as a unit, and make our way around those big rocks. Because the rocks we will encounter are real. They are not inflatable. So if we're riding along and you're paddling and you happen to stab one, because you just want us to get away from it and you're just really upset that this is there, I guarantee you that rock will win. You will wake up that rock and make it angry and it is going to take your paddle and shove it back into your face and give you summer teeth. Do you know what summer teeth are? It's when some of your teeth are in your mouth and some of your teeth are in the river. <laughs> so the best bet is to keep paddling and to steer around those rocks. But no matter how hard we do that, there are times when we're gonna hit a rock. So when it happens, guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna kiss the rock. What? Let me tell you why. If we are paddling and you see this big thing here is a rock and you decide to run away on our raft from the rock and we all climb to the back end as we ride up, guess what? We're all gonna go for a swim. So if we run away from it, we're likely to fall in. So we're going to kiss the rock, all right? It's not fun to get pinned or stuck on a big rock. It makes for a complicated rescue. It takes up a lot of time that we could have been spent enjoying floating down the river. So we're going to need to work together to avoid them. But if they do come, we're going to lean into those rocks, all right? So that's rule number three. Lean into the rocks rather than away from them. You got that? I'm not going overboard today. I got on a suit. All right? So what are our rules so far? We've got rest in the calm spots, never stop paddling, and lean into the rocks. Kiss that rock. All right, so fourth, if you do get thrown into the water, let go of everything but your tip. I mean, let go of everything but your life jacket. Because if you find yourself in the water, you're going to want to have hands free, 
to help protect yourself. So you're going to float on your back with your feet first so that you can try to fend off the rocks. Unless, of course, you're better at fending off rocks with your head, but most of us prefer our feet. And so that's rule number four. When you're tossed overboard, let go of everything but your life jacket. And now when you're in that water, don't stand up. Don't try to fight that river by yourself and make it back to where you think you ought to be. You got to let go. You got to swim and just float and relax in those rapids until we pick you up. Because you know what happens if you try to stand up in that water? At one point or another, you're going to step on a rock and you're going to make it angry. And it's going to grab your foot and it's going to pin you and the water is going to keep pushing and you're going to get stuck and it's going to be a scary experience. So you just float and you ask for help and you don't try to navigate that tumultuous water by yourself and just know that we're going to get there and you're going to have a great story to tell. We are not more powerful than the river. So, do you got the five rules? We're going to relax in the calm spot. We're going to never stop paddling. We're going to lean into those rocks. If you fall in, you let go of everything but your life jacket. And don't try to stand up on your own in the rapids. So with that, let's have a good ride. Right? All right. So in our lives and in our shared life as a congregation, let's rest together in the calm spots and go with the flow of life. Not the flow of what's easiest and not the flow of mainstream society but with the flow of what life beckons us to. May we never stop paddling, maintaining those spiritual practices that strengthen us and bind us together, that we can survive those big obstacles when they come, because they do. And may we lean into the challenges that we experience, that we may not allow fear to rule our fate. And when the waves of change swell and make it over the bow of that boat and they suck us out into the water, may we ask for help and never try to go it alone. And may we let go of everything but the life jacket that is being open to life once again. Amen. <laughs>